Welcome and a joyous Sabbath to you, dear friends. What a precious privilege and a wondrous opportunity to stand in God's divine presence in these holy hours the Lord has blessed us with. We have a special word that God has prepared for us, and we pray that he would prepare our hearts to receive it with fullness and with great joy. For our reflection this evening, I'd like you to turn your thoughts with me to the pages of the pen of inspiration and listen to these powerful words from the book Christ Object Lesson, page 171, paragraph 2 and 3. The prophet says, In the parable of the unjust judge, Christ has shown what we should do. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Christ, our example, did nothing to vindicate or deliver himself. He committed his case to God. So his followers are not to accuse or condemn or to resort to force in order to deliver themselves. When trials arise that seem unexplainable, we should not allow our peace to be spoiled. However unjustly we may be treated, let not passion arise. By indulging a spirit of retaliation, we injure ourselves. We destroy our own confidence in God and grieve the Holy Spirit. There is by our side a witness, a heavenly messenger, who will lift up for us a standard against the enemy. He will shut us in with the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. Beyond this, Satan cannot penetrate. He cannot pass the shield of holy light. Dear brothers and sisters, what a precious reminder is afforded us this Sabbath day. The Lord reminds us that we are to cry unto God. There isn't a greater deliverer. Neither can anyone represent our case better than Jesus Christ. Sure, friends, all of us face trials. All of us may at one point or another face opposition. As the prophet says, when we experience these trials that come to us inexplainably, we should not allow our peace to be spoiled. The Bible tells us that peace comes from having Jesus. This means, friends, that we are to always make sure that our relationship with Jesus is right, that we are always pleading for Christ to live within our hearts so that we allow nothing and no one to rob us of that peace that is the result of Christ's abiding presence. Friends, what we're facing right now we're going to face much worse in the times that are ahead of us. And friends, I just pray that we all would learn to face these daily trials and tribulations in Jesus so that at the final test and the greater persecution that's coming, we would represent God rightly, that we would magnify Jesus, that we would see Jesus through the stones that come at us and still lift his holy name on high that even in persecution, we bear a faithful witness of who Jesus is. Friends, I pray that we would learn to live looking unto Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you so much. Thank you, God, for the wonderful privilege to know that Jesus is by our side, to know that he stands as our defense, that he would raise a standard that the enemy cannot penetrate, that is, as his holy light shines bright in our hearts, there will be no place left for the enemy's darkness. Thank you once again, Father, for appealing to us, for inviting us, and for cherishing us with all your heart. Please speak to us afresh from your word today. Bless your child who you have prepared in the power of your Holy Spirit, that these words would stir us alive, that we would allow your words to be engraved upon our hearts and live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Help us, Lord, to stand with Jesus. Help us to plead for your presence to abide in our hearts, that we would not allow the world to shake us from faith, eternal faith in thee. Thank you for blessing us, God. Continue to speak to us, build us, perfect us, that we would always be representing you rightly. We give you 
all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Sabbath church. The song says, Redeeming Love. 
has been my theme and shall be till I die. That is the promise of being a Christian. We have a redeeming love. Even though we don't deserve it, it is freely given to us. We're going to get right into it today. We have a lot to cover. Um, I thank you all for your prayers while we were in India. It was a phenomenal, amazing um, trip. Um, we are so happy to have met um, our brothers and sisters in Christ on the other side of the world. Um, driving around was a little frightening, um, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> I thought Jamaica was bad. Uh, <laughs> I was like, it, was, it was pretty rough. Um, but the people were amazing. Our, um, our, you know, our, our host family, um, um, they were just phenomenal. And so we thank God for them, and we need to keep them in prayer. While we still live in a bastion of freedom, um, the government there, I'll talk more about it in a minute, is actually beginning to crack down on Christianity. Um, India is now the most populated nation in the world. It has surpassed China. So this is a large portion of the world's population. And there is obviously a spiritual war going on in India for the souls of every single citizen. Um, that I don't think many of us really can uh, fathom. And so they do need our prayers, and I, I send them greetings. I know they, they, they rebroadcast our messages over there. Um, so it was very interesting. One of the funny stories was there's a little baby, and a lady comes up to me with the little baby, and she says, and I start talking, and the baby starts smiling. And I said, oh, look, the baby's smiling. She said, yes, during the pandemic, I was pregnant, and every day I listen to your sermons. And she said, the baby knows your voice. <laughs> And so the baby, when I talked, the baby smiled. And then when Jackie came over, the lady said, and when you sing, she smiles too. <laughs> it was very, very beautiful. So we'll keep them in prayer and know that we are part of a worldwide family of God. Never forget that. Worldwide. So we're going to get into God's word. Again, we have a lot to cover. Um, we only have a few more pieces in this series, uh, a few more uh, presentations. I do want to tell you that yesterday... Alex and Carrie were kind enough to meet me here in the morning on Black Friday. Rather than fighting for televisions or new toys, um, we recorded um, a supplement to the last message, um, Israel and the Last War, which has gotten overwhelming response. People have been hitting me up on my personal um, um, <laughs> means. Um, and so we actually went through and clarified. So we actually put down a whole nother message, really reinforcing a lot of what we talked about. So it's on YouTube, it's on our church website, so you can pick that up, you can, you can watch that as well. Today we're going to go a little deeper into a very um, sometimes difficult topic for many Adventists. In Revelation chapter 22, I'm going to read what uh, Donnie read, uh, verse 11, and I'm also going to add verse 12. Revelation 22, 11 and 12 says this, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And here's the key part, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Our message this Sabbath is entitled, The Close of of probation. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to study your word. Once again, Lord, I ask that you make me just a nail on the wall. But Lord, upon that nail, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Lord, this subject is one that challenges many Christians. So Father God, we are asking for an extra outpouring of your Holy Spirit. This is not me that needs to be heard today, Father God. We need to hear a word from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. And so we start often with a prophet, with some prophecy updates. Um, and so I'll, I'll look at some of the things that are going on that fit into the series, things that are going on in the world right now that uh, reinforces a lot of what we've been discussing. Number one, we have a new speaker of the house, Mike Johnson, um, who is the, the, the guardian, which leans left. So I uh, take this with a pinch of salt at that point. The House Speaker and a plot against America. So they said this guy, they're really trying to demonize Mike Johnson. Part of that is because he's, a, he's outwardly and openly Christian. 
and I have no problem with the fact that he's Christian. I think it's wonderful that he's Christian. More frightening, I think, when we as Adventists uh, consider the fact that Revelation chapter 13, the second beast is said to have two horns like a lamb. We talked about that earlier and speak as a dragon. The speaking of a, as a dragon is persecutor, persecutory um, power. It is a way to control people through uh, um, basically religious intolerance. Our constitution guarantees us uh, certain religious freedoms. And for that reason, America allows people to exist and have beliefs that you may not agree with. In fact, you must fight for the beliefs of people you don't agree with if you hope to keep your right to worship and believe the way you do. That is what makes America different. That is what the two little horns, in a sense, actually equate to. It is this unique principle. But look at what he says. This is just from the article. The new House Speaker, Mike Johnson, knows how he will rule, according to his Bible. When asked on Fox News how he would make public policy, he replied, well, go pick up well, go pick up a Bible off your shelf and read it. That's my worldview. But it's taking time for the full significance of that statement to sink in. Johnson, in fact, is a believer in scriptural originalism, the view that the Bible is the truth and the sole legitimate source for public policy. So I believe the Bible is the truth. Um, but when it comes to public policy, obviously we believe that we separate church and state, as Adventists we do. But look at the second paragraph. It says, he was most candid about this in, a 2000, in 2016 when he declared, you know, we don't live in a democracy, but a biblical republic. Chalk up his elevation to the speakership as the greatest victory so far within Congress for the religious right in its holy war to turn the United States government into a theocracy. Now, I say that knowing that America needs more Christian leaders. Uh, that's not my problem with him. My problem is, as we discussed earlier, when the time comes for a day to be chosen, if he does not understand scripture properly, which day will he choose? And you begin to see how this can pan out. Now, why is this relevant? Because while I was in India, God revealed something to me. I wondered how is it that the entire world would keep the Sunday law or, or have one? And Modi, the prime minister of India, is a staunch pro-Hindu um, leader. He wants all of India to be Hindu. And as you go around the world, you start to realize that there are autocrats, um, you know, ideologues who are being uh, brought into power who want to m blend government and religion. And God showed me the whole world does not have to become Catholic or evangelical Christian for the Sunday law to pass. They simply all have to be a part of an ecumenical movement where government and religion blend. And church, that is happening all over the world. We saw it in India where if you, um, they were telling us that in some of the provinces or some of the states in India, if, you are a con if someone says that they were converted to Christianity, literally they can, they can go and tell the police and go back to you. And in some states, you can be put in prison for up to 10 years for converting someone to Christianity. We talk about a time of trouble as if it's future. But I want to tell you that there are those who are suffering in a time of trouble right now. The second one, of course, is the war in, in um, the Middle East. Um, they did strike a deal this week. We talked about that um, a few weeks back. Um, some hostages have actually been released. I can tell you that this deal is important, um, but it is um, just a kind of a continuation. We will see how it comes forward. But prophetically remember... As the Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we do not think that this war is necessary or the expansion of Israel or the establishment of a third temple is necessary for Jesus to return. None of those things are required. And hence, there is a lot of false doctrine around this war and false understanding. In the, in the realm of um, global warming, the Washington Post reports here, the Earth passed a feared global warming milestone Friday, at least briefly, and they talk about what it is. And so many more are up in arms about global warming and the environment. And while global warming, you can believe it, not believe it, whatever you want to do. What I will tell you is that from a policy standpoint, the idea of a, of a dying planet is one of the ways that many things are going to be ushered in. And you can already begin to see that that's happening. Some people say, ah, oh, we shouldn't be talking about that. But 
you, it's important when you study prophecy to be, as the mechanisms begin to open up as to how the prophecy is going to be fulfilled to actually look at it, study it, not out of fear, but because in a sense, as, as Peter says, listen, we have a more sure word of prophecy. The more you understand prophecy, the more courage and faith you have in the word of God. So the last prophecy update is this one. Shocked me this week that on TikTok, and I do not have TikTok, amen, um, but on the TikTok, they sent around Osama bin Laden's letter to America. Did you guys hear about this? And it reached millions. It had over 15 million hits before they took it down. Now, some of you know who owns TikTok. Um, it's the Chinese that own, the Chinese government that owns TikTok. So they're happy to float this. And what shocked me, talk about prophecy being fulfilled, is that Americans went on TikTok giving testimonials that after reading it, it was a life-changing event. That they will never see America the same. And that um, now they understand that, that, that how horrible America's foreign policy has been. Here is a country where people are so easily deceived that they would listen to the words of an evil man like Osama bin Laden and think he is speaking truth. Jesus, when he, in Matthew 24, uh, you know, we always say it. The first warning he gives you about the end times is do not be deceived. How easily are you deceived when literally you think Osama bin Laden is somebody you ought to listen to? Man flew two planes into the, into, into, into the, into the World Trade Center and two other planes crashed. Not only that, if he had his way while he was alive, he'd have killed every American. Not just American, almost, almost the entire Western civilization would have been wiped out. This is the time we live in. And I'm going to show you from our, our Bible story here that this is prophecy being fulfilled. Genesis 6 and verse 1. One of my favorite Bible stories is the story of Noah and the flood. And one of our series is going to be on um, creation versus evolution. I can't wait to get to that one. And, I'm, and we're going to talk about the flood and the evidence for the flood. But that's not what we're going to do today. Genesis 6 and verse 1 says this. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, here's the key verse here, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is what? He's flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. This is an important, if you want to understand the close of probation, the world has gone through many cycles where probation has closed on folk. It closed here on the antediluvian world. You remember the king of Babylon, when Mini Mini Tikalu Farsin, probation closed on them. It's the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, prob uh, a probation closed on them. And in almost every instance, God speaks directly to why it would close. In fact, in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the pre-incarnate Christ and angels visit Abraham and the angels go to visit Lot. And what does the pre-incarnate Christ say? What does the Lord say? He says he came to see for himself if the wickedness that had risen to heaven was actually the way it is. That is to tell you that there, before probation closes, there is always a pre-investigative uh, 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 pre, uh, uh, judgment. God always looks at it. He always, why? Because God's character is also on trial in the universe. So before he does anything, he has to show, lay out his case as to why what's about to happen happens. Now watch this. Men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Daughters were born unto them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. Some people think that these are aliens, the sons of, uh, the, uh, the sons of God. Some people think they're angels. They read the, the apocryphal uh, book, the, 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 the um, book of Enoch, and they say, oh, these are angels. Let me tell you, the Bible makes it clear that angels neither marry nor are giving in marriage. What is the purpose of marriage? It is reproduction. So uh, like that's one key element of marriage biblically. So if the angels don't marry, then they don't reproduce. If they don't reproduce, then they can't be the sons of God. Who were the sons of God? These were the descendants of Seth. And the daughters of men are the descendants of Cain. And what happened is that they came together <clears throat> um, and the men who were supposed to keep themselves from being unequally yoked began to mix with women they weren't supposed to. Why? The Bible makes it clear. 
because they were fair. These are very good looking women. They may not have been very godly, but they were good looking. And so instead of choosing the woman on their character, they chose them based on how they looked. And this is what happened. When, God, when this happened, the Bible says, God says, my spirit shall not always strive with men. Why? He was so upset at this mixing of the two groups of people that were never supposed to mix. Don't miss that. Because later on, we're going to talk about the 144,000, and it says that they were virgins, that they had not been defiled with women. It, it speaks not just to the physical, sexual sin that happens. It speaks also to the doctrinal corruption that happens when we mix and are not yoked the way God says we ought to be. Now look at verse 3. He says, my spirit shall not always strive with men. You see here at Seventh-day Adventists always talking about God's spirit is being withdrawn from the earth Here's where, one of the places in the Bible at least, where you get a concrete evidence. He says, my spirit will not always strive with men. <clears throat> and he gives a probationary period. How long? 120 years. This is not speaking to the, the lifespan of man. This is how long Noah would have. Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. That word giant, some people think, means that they were tall. But if you really study the spirit of prophecy, the, all humans at that time had great stature. It wasn't that they were giants that way. In fact, the word Nephilim can also be translated as violent or terrorist. They were People who would, through violence, they created terror on the earth. Now watch this. And that was how they were giant in stature. It was in their ability to take what they didn't, what was not theirs. In fact, the spirit of prophecy, speaking of the antediluvian world, said their sin was appetite and the fact that when they wanted something, they used violence to get it. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil what? Do you get that? Now, so why, just remember, God always, he never makes judgment, he never closes probation, he never does any of those things without first making an assessment. This is why we believe in a pre-advent judgment. It is consistent throughout scripture. Here he makes the assessment. He says, I can't stay with them. The wickedness of man is so great. His thought is only evil continually. Let me tell you something. Some people say, well, and I'm going to show you a little bit more on this. Some people say, well, God is cruel to have done what he did in this story. But really, what would be cruel would be to leave men to live in a world overrun by violence and danger. Now, verse 6, here's where it gets interesting. It says, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Look at this. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Why did it repent him? Because God never designed for us to live in a world where you'd be worried that you get robbed. Never designed for you to live in a world where death exists, where forcible violence exists. Never designed. When God looked at the condition of the world and the ideal he had for man, he looked and God said, man, I'm so sorry. Ha, but verse 8, the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Whenever there is a judgment, there are those who find grace. Now, verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Notice how many times the word violence comes up. God is looking at the condition of the earth and he's tired of watching man victimize man. He says, it's enough. I'm going to do away with this earth and start over. So, why did the probation close for the antediluvian world? Now, there are two ways you can describe the world before the flood. One of them, the word we use in English is antediluvian. There's, Ellen White sometimes uses the word the Noetian world. 
which is to say Noah's world. So either word you can use, but I'll use antediluvian. Number one, sexual sin. The sons of God with the daughters of men. So when you think about this, this is the same thing that happened. You remember when they were about to cross into the promised land and um, Balaam and Balak, King Balak brought Balaam? It was sexual sin that caused the children of Israel to wander an extra 40 years in the wilderness when they went after the women of Moab. Sexual sin was the sin that also helped bring down the world before the flood. I want to submit to you that in these last days, sexual sin will bring many to be destroyed rather than to be received into the kingdom of glory. A lot of pulpits don't talk about that. We don't want to talk about the dangers of pornography. We don't want to talk about the dangers of illicit sex. We don't want to talk about how corrupt the world has become, how dis debased the world has become, the conversations in public theater, the, the way the world dresses and carries on and all of these things, the way that they uh, elevate uh, debauchery. But the church of the living God ought not have any part in that. The second one is violence in the land. And the third is man's flesh was incompatible with God's spirit. God said, listen, my, I can't, my spirit can't always strive with man because he is flesh. And we know that what God asks us to be is to be born of the spirit. And because man was so hardened, his heart was so hardened that his, the spirit of God could not work on him any longer. They would not listen to the spirit of God. God said, because they are flesh, and they're not functioning in the spirit, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8. Because man was only living in the flesh. And you know what modern society tells you to do? Your own thing. Follow your heart. That's what Disney teaches your children. The heart is dark and it is wicked. You don't want to, if you follow your heart, you'll follow your heart into destruction. The heart that we are, all have, the heart of man is is, is, is very wicked. So, let's look at this. An interesting one here is the word violence. I, I mentioned this, I'll read it here. There were giants in the earth. These giants, or Nephilim, were not the product of mixed marriages, as some have suggested. The Septuagint translated Nephilim by Gigantes, which um, it, the English giant is derived. In Numbers 13.33, the Israelites reported that they felt like mere grasshoppers in the side of the Nephilim, of which the King James Version translates as giants. There's, there's reason to believe that this Hebrew word may come uh, from the root nafal and that the Nephilim were violent ones or terrorists rather than physical giants. And that's from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. I want you to show you why violence was such a serious thing. Here is the word violence in Hebrew. It is the word Hamas. It is the word Hamas. King James Version, violence, damage, cruel, cruelty, false, oppressor. Literally, the world in Genesis chapter 6 was filled with Hamas. Isn't that deep? The concept of violence to get what I want because I want it. Any kind of violence. And I believe under that same name, you see a glimpse of the kind of violence that existed before the flood. And it is the kind of violence that is filling this world. Why God must once again cut the work short. So let me show you how violent is the world. These are ongoing wars in the world. Um, I got this off of Wikipedia. I don't know if they even include the war in the Middle East up here. Um, but these are the wars going on in the world. Mexico is said to be in a war because of the cartels, which tells me that they, somebody did not calculate right. Because if there's a war going on, there's a war going on in the streets of Chicago. There's a war going on in the streets of Memphis, Tennessee, Washington, D.C. The number of gun deaths especially by Latino and black young men in this country, is astounding. And I was going to show that. I was going to show the graph of that. But there's war going on all over the world, including in the United States of America. You look at the war on drugs and gang war, there's war everywhere. We see this in Dublin this week. There, um, there were riots. They say the far right people, there was three uh, kids stabbed outside of a school. And the violence, you know, instantaneously, during or after George Floyd's death, violence. It was a time when we protested in America peacefully during the civil rights movement. Now we have as a society has accepted that when people protest, stuff is going to get burned and looted. That's violence. It is unchristian even. And our society has begun to believe that somehow that is normal and acceptable. But it speaks to the Hamas, the violence of our day. <coughs> 
Mass shootings on, in the United States are on the rise. I'm just showing you the violence. Because Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be when the Son of Man returns. One of the, what is the, one of the hallmarks of Noah's day? Violence. This is the world we live in. This is America. All of these mass shootings. So then why was a 120 year period of probation given? What happened? <clears throat> and why did God give this period of probation? Well, Matthew 24, 37 actually speaks to it. I'll just, I quoted it, but here's it here. Let's read it. Matthew 24, 37 says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Here's where the close of probation gets interesting. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. One of the key things about the close of probation is there will be no physical, no environmental. There will be no uh, sign in the world that it is closed. When it closes, it closes. And men will go on as if nothing has happened, even when their fates have been eternally sealed, just like during the flood. Second Peter chapter three and verse three says it like this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. There, and you hear this now. People say, if you seven there, then it's a crazy. You're waiting for Jesus to come. Jesus has been gone over 2,000 years. Where is he? They are. You've been waiting since 1844. You guys are crazy. What's wrong with you? Jesus isn't coming back. They're more afraid that the world will overheat in climate change than they are of the second coming of our Lord. But look at what the Bible says. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 5 through 7 says this. For this they are willingly are ignorant of. And I'm going to show you what that means in the commentary in a second. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. It's speaking of the antediluvian world. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Verse 6. Whereby, I have one. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Look at this. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. What are they kept in store for? Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The same power that held the antediluvian world in check until the flood came is the same power. We're going to look at Romans, uh, Revelation chapter 7. It is the same power holding this world in check right now. While they scoff, they literally scoff at God's mercy. The only reason they're not destroyed is because of his mercy. Even the wicked are allowed to live because of God's mercy. Here's what the commentary says. Watch this. Verse 5. This, right? And this, this is from, you see, for this they will willingly are ignorant of. Verse 5, this. this cl the, the clause reads literally, this escapes their notice by their own will. Did you get that? The scoffers knew of the flood, but deliberately chose to ignore the cataclysm and its message to mankind. By so doing, they closed their minds against the idea of the possibility of further divine intervention when Christ should return. And you know, one of the main things that they laugh at about Christians, the flood. I, I, I mean, I, I did years of science. I, I mean, obviously, I did, you know, going to medical school and I mean, years, and I can tell you one of the things that the world laughs at the most that we believe in is the flood. Yet, if you go to places, websites like Answers in Genesis, um, and there's some other, listen to Walter Weiss presentations, um, the, the one, um, the Days of Noah that Layman Ministries put out, that series, go and look at the evidence for the flood. It's overwhelming. They find seashells on the top of mountains. How did they get there? Last I checked, seashells can't fly. And I'm telling you, the part of the reason is spiritual. Because if man was to ever accept that God wants, in his displeasure with the condition of earth, wiped out the planet with a flood, they'd have to recognize that that can happen again. 
In fact, they mocked. This is from the movie 2012. I screenshot it off of YouTube with, I think those are Korean or Chinese characters. I don't know. But in this scene, this, this guy, they, they built these arcs. They said the world was going to die, was going to end because of climate change. So it's one of those movies that scare you, 2012. And basically, if you go back to when Al Gore made his movie, his documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, a lot of what he said would have happened in five years and ten years has not happened. It Literally, you go back and watch it yourself. So he had to make a part two. Um, it's funny how they keep making part sequels to the end of the world movies. Um, but in this scene, he literally is chastising the idea that you would have arcs because they built arcs. This is the scene in the movie. And you're supposed to be, you know, and, they, and only a few could get on the ark, mocking the oh, Noah's eight. And he, ha- he makes the statement, one, civilization means we work together to create a better life. And he says, and then one the, guy, the, one, the other guy says, listen, we can't save everybody. He says, what do you do with those people? And you know what the guy says? They are in God's hands. That's what the movie says, in order to mock God, right? And he says, the statement that the atheist and many will say in objection to the story of the flood, the mean character, this, this brother here, he says, how do we start the earth over with an act of cruelty. That's what the movie says. You know what they're doing? Especially the young people who don't read their Bible, who are being indoctrinated in schools around evolution and Marxism. They, this planted in their mind that the God of the Bible is a cruel, unjust God who restarted the world with an act of cruelty. If you're not teaching your children the Bible, if you don't understand why the Bible, why the things in the Bible happen the way they happen, you're robbing your child because they're going to sit in the front of the world and the world will indoctrinate your child against the God of heaven. And these are multi-million dollar movies. So they've got the music and everything to bring your mind to a place. And I've talked about television here before, how when you watch television, you actually turn down your brain waves into a more hypnotic state where you cannot critically think. So as these scenes are being passed and they ridicule God, your child is made the enemy of the creator. And here, some of us have been made his enemy. So... When will a closed probation happen? Mark 13, 33 says this, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. There are no more time prophecies after 1844. So when somebody starts telling you, well, in, you know, in, in 2035, this is going to happen. 20, 2030, don't even listen to them. That's not where you are. We are not at the place where we're trying to predict what happens next. We're at a place where we're trying to be prepared for what happens next. There's a big difference. A lot of folks get a lot of confidence in being able to say, ah, in five years, this is going to happen. Or, time prophecies are done. The Bible makes it clear nobody knows when the time is. Testimonies, volume 2, page 337, says it like this. Men and women are in the last hours of probation and yet are careless and stupid. And ministers have no power to arouse them. Watch this. They are asleep themselves. Sleeping preachers preaching to a sleeping people. You see, there are two reasons for the close of probation. Two reasons. Number one, to show the mercy of God in allowing men to live with their choices. Probation has to close in order for God to respect everyone's decision. You understand what I'm saying? Probation has to close because every man has made a decision. God at some point has to say, I respect your decision. He's not a tyrant. He will respect everybody's decision. And two, probation has to close for sin to be, to be put, uh, uh, an end to be put to sin. Nahum 1.9, affliction shall not rise up a second time. Let me tell you, as a Christian, that ought to be your hope. That although we live in a sin-sick, difficult world now, the day is coming when sin will not exist in the entire universe. So, there are three different ways that probation closes. Three different ways. Number one is death. Hebrews 9, 27, and it, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this what? The judgment. When someone dies, their probation has closed. Right? Ecclesiastes 9 tells you that these uh, um, five um, says that the, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. 
Neither have they any more any part of anything that is done under the sun. Their memories are gone. Their thoughts are gone. It's all gone. You don't get to make a choice after you're dead. So there's even the Mormon idea of baptizing for the dead, not biblical. In fact, one of the big heresies is this one, purgatory. The Catholic doctrine of purgatory says that after you die, purgatory basically means you go to a place where you are purified to go to heaven. Catholics believe that purgatory is the state in which the souls of the dead are purified from the consequences of their sins. The Bible says uh, 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 that nothing unclean or impure is going to enter into heaven. So they say, well, you must go through a period of purification. But this is a slap in the face of the mercy of God while you are alive. The time to make your life right isn't after you die. The time to make your life right is now. The doctrine of purgatory. And I, I tell you all the time, John F. Kennedy's family, after he died, they paid $10,000 back in 1963 um, to, to move him from purgatory into heaven. I wonder how $10,000 purified him. If that's the case, I'll wash whatever they want wash for that $10,000. That don't make no sense. Right? So that's the first one, death. The second one is this. It is the rejection of the Holy Spirit. Your probation can close um, if you reject the Holy Spirit. And let me make this clear. It is not that God closes your probation. It is that you have closed your own probation. Matthew chapter 12, 31 says this. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Why is that? Because it is the Holy Spirit that leads us to truth. It is the Holy Spirit that transforms our character, that brings us to repentance. It is the Holy Spirit, him working in us, that does this. If you reject the Holy Spirit, there's no hope for you. That's why Jesus says, it's all, if you blaspheme against me, you can have that forgiven. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, it's over. This is why the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is such an important doctrine. A lot of people trying to make the Holy Spirit into a force like, like Obi-Wan Kenobi or Luke Skywalker had. The Holy Spirit is a person. Look at this. Acts 13, verse 2 says this. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, the Holy Ghost spoke. Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. The Holy Spirit is a person. Forces don't speak like that. Isaiah 63, 10, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. Now, here's what evangelism, 617, this is what the spirit of prophecy says on the, on the Holy Spirit. This is important. If you're studying the close of probation, you must understand the work of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people have missed it. The Holy Spirit has a personality, Ellen White says, else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person, else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. And I could go on, I do a whole thing on just the Holy Spirit. But I, I, I bring this up. Because in these last days, we have to be praying for the Holy Spirit. Now, Hebrews 10, 26 says this. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Uh, verse 29, of how much sore punishment, look at this, Suppose ye shall he be a thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despot unto the spirit of grace. This is what happens. It's speaking to what happens when you trample on the spirit on Christ's sacrifice and you disrespect God's Holy Spirit. For we know in him that uh, for we know him that hath said, vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of what? Of the living God. That's a fearful thing. Here's what it means. Done despot. 
uh, the Sestier Bible commentary, Hebrews 10 says this. It comes from the Greek word enubrizo, to insult, to outrage. The persistent refusal to heed the promptings of the Holy Spirit reflects contempt for them. Concerning the various ways by which men may insult the Holy Spirit and commit the unpardonable sin, you can see Matthew 12, 31 and 32, or Ephesians 4 and verse 30. You see, we close our own probation. God simply accepts our choice. Never forget that. Because when I was growing up, there were people at Faith Church in Hartford, there were people that say, oh, you never know. You could be walking back from the store and your probation closed. Just randomly, just boom, your probation just shut down like a car engine that broke, right? That's not the way it works. And a lot of Adventists are afraid. Oh my goodness, what if my probation closes today? You close your probation. As long as you seek the face of God and you have breath in your, in your lungs, your probation is open. The last one is in the last days. When all have decided, this is the third way that probation closes, when all have decided for or against God. Matthew 24 and verse uh, 14 says this, and, the, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Why is this verse in there? This is speaking to the close of probation. Why is it that the gospel has to be preached? Notice it doesn't say everybody has to be, Osama bin Laden and Hamas, they say the whole world has to become Muslim. That's the final end of the world. Christianity does not say the whole world has to become Christian for the end to come. Instead, it simply says that the gospel must be preached to everyone so that they have an opportunity to make a choice. When everyone has had an opportunity to make, this is why the devil fights the spreading of the gospel the way he does. He fights it because he knows that when the whole world has heard this gospel of truth, when they have all had an opportunity to make a decision, the end will come. Jesus says, Revelation 16, 15, he says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Probation will close. If you're not watching, you'll be walking around naked thinking you're clothed. But if it's your own self-righteousness that you're clothed in, you're still naked. He says he comes as a thief. because No one will know when he comes. The world will be going on as it was, just as in the days of Noah. But Daniel probably gives it the best. He really shows you the close of probation and its meaning. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, we'll talk about that next time, such as never once since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. This gives you all kinds of information on the end of the world and the close of probation. It's all here. Michael stands up. I don't have time to get into it today, but Michael is Christ. I wish I had time to break it down because people think we're crazy to believe this. But this is easily biblical. Right? Right? So Michael stands up. Where is he at? He's in the temple, in the most holy place in the heavenly temple. He stands up. He stops the work of intercession. I'll show you more of that in a second. Right? Then the time of trouble comes. Why? Because when he is moved out of the most holy place, there is no, nothing between Satan and earth. And this is Revelation 7, 3 says, the winds of strife are released. It's the same thing. And so a time of trouble begins because there's no protection for mankind. But, here's the hope for the Christian, at that time, thy people shall be delivered. So it's a short period of time. And that's why the Bible says that for the elect's sake, the time will be what? Cut short. It'll be a short period of time when God's people are going through Jacob's time of trouble and the great time of trouble. And everyone whose name is written in the, in the book of life. That means your name was already written there. Who, who, when was it written there? It was written there during the investigative judgment. That's why he says, I come, behold, I come, and my reward is with me. That's why judgment begins at the house of God. It begins with us. Why? Because we're the ones getting the reward. Some of you are afraid of the judgment. I'm not afraid of the judgment. I want the judgment to come because I want my reward. I can't wait to put on my crown. Daniel goes on. Daniel 12, 2 and 3 says this. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is speaking of the second coming. 
And they that be wise shall shine as, as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Those who have survived through this great time of trouble, those are the wise ones. How does the Bible define a fool? The Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Those who live as if there's no God, even if they say they believe in one, are just as foolish as the ones who say there is no God. The wise are the ones that say there is a God and I'm going to submit my life to him. Revelation 7, verse 1. And after these things, continue the same thing. So Michael stands up. And what happens when Michael stands up? Here it is. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What happens during this probationary time? At the end of the world, God's people are sealed. You know what the world tells you to do? Open up your mind. Go and do um, uh, yoga and go and do meditation and open up your mind. Don't open up your mind. You're not a trash can. Keep your mind shut. In fact, God wants to seal your mind. They got people just open up their mind to all kind of foolishness. They wonder why they can't sleep at night. Your mind is to be sealed in the frontal lobe of your brain. 33% of the human brain is frontal lobe. There's a seal that will happen, and it is the work of the Holy Ghost perfecting the character of God's people that is found in verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. They were sealed. What, what are they sealed with? They're sealed by the Holy Spirit, settled into truth. <clears throat> they were sealed 144,000. Of all the tribes of Israel, if you want to get deeper on this, you got to listen to the message we recorded yesterday. Because I, I, I go through this where Nathaniel in, in Luke 1, 47, it says, uh, behold, Nathaniel, Jesus speaking to Nathaniel says, Nathaniel, he says, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. The definition of an Israelite is not by blood. It is by the fact that you've been so transformed by the Holy Spirit that you are Israelite indeed, that there's no guile found in you. So look at how the Bible defines this 144,000. Revelation 14, 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having the Father's name written where? In their foreheads. Two things are written now in the forehead. It's the seal of God. Ellen White says that the seal of God is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. That's why when God, Jesus steps out of his work as mediator in Daniel 12, 1, the people of God stay firm. They go through a great time of trouble, but they've been sealed. Their belief in God is so strong that it doesn't matter what the devil throws at them. They stay faithful to God. This is why God allows it. In fact, it is the last great test. The whole universe watches as the devil throws everything at God's people, yet they stay faithful while Christ is not in the most holy place. And at the end, even the devil himself will bow and every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Part of that is because God's people during the time of trouble do not break because we've been sealed. But you can't expect to be sealed then. The sealing process is now. And not only are they sealed, they have the Father's name written in their forehead. What does a name represent in the Bible? It represents your character. Why do you want God's, right? It's, it's not, he's not putting a name on your forehead like Gucci or something. He's putting a name in your forehead because putting his name in your forehead is a transformation of your character. So that you have the character of Christ. So you're sealed and you have God's name in your forehead. You're different. And these are the ones who come out of this great tribulation. This is us, church. Verse 2, he says, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And look at this. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Not even the angels can sing this song. And look at how it defines them. <clears throat> Verse 4. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. I mentioned that earlier. This is not simply like a physical thing. This is speaking to doctrinal purity. 
right? The woman represents the church. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile. You see that? For, it, for they are without fault before the throne of God. How are they without fault? Because of the work Christ has done for them and the work the Holy Spirit has done in them. That's why their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's why when Michael stands up, he stands up. In fact, if you go back and read the Hebrew word for stands, it is, to, it is to protect. He stands up to protect them. That's why he then goes and saves the people of God in Daniel 12. 1. That's the work of Christ as he stands up. It is to come and get us. Revelation 15, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled the, up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten a victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Who are these? These are those that have been sealed. They don't have the mark of the beast because they have the seal of God. Amen. And they sing the song of Moses and the, the, uh, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after he, uh, John says, I looked and behold, the temple in heaven of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And here it is, verse 8. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled, which tells us, when he stands up, no man can enter in. If we, I could take you back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It's actually referenced there. When that place is full of smoke, no man, nobody, the high priest, no one's in there. So when he stands up and moves out, it's full of smoke. That means there's no more uh, a mediator in the most holy place. And that's when the seven last plagues begin to fall on the earth. It happens after the close of probation. Revelation 8 and 3 says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And the angel took the censer and filled it with, with fire uh, of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. Ellen White, uh, oh, sorry, the SDA Bible commentary says this, According to the view that Seventh-day Adventists have favored, the cessation of the angel's ministry at the altar of incense is symbolic of the end of the ministration of Christ for mankind. It is the close of probation. The voices, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes that ensue when the angel casts the center into the earth describes events to take place at the end of the seventh trumpet following the opening of the temple. And at the seventh plague, when a voice comes from the temple declaring, it is done. And this is when this proclamation is made. When Jesus stands up and takes off his priestly robe to put on his kingly robe to return to earth. And we'll talk about in a couple of uh, 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 messages from now. Revelation 22, 11, he says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Once he stops mediating, that's it. And he which is filthy, uh, he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And then he says, and behold, I come quickly. Why does he come quickly now? <clears throat> because there's no mediator. The time is cut short for the sake of the elect, because what we will be going through on earth, as we're going to talk about next time, is going to be unbearable. And you cannot prepare for it then. Comes quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. You are not saved by your works, but you will be judged by them. Revelation 16, 17 says this, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven saying, from the throne saying, what? It is done. Verse 18, And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. Such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. 
And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the wrath, of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. Instead of repenting, this is how you know the Spirit of God had done its work. Instead of repenting, they blasphemed God. Why is that relevant? Because the unfallen worlds and unfallen angels will watch and see that even as God is pouring out his wrath, they still will not be humbled. And still they will blaspheme against God, which means that their condition is fixed, not because God fixed it, they fixed it. Cool. The last little thing I will talk about is this. Because many people are afraid of the judgment. They're afraid of the close of probation. And part of the reason they're afraid of the close of probation is because this idea you'll be left without a mediator. And this frightens people. They say, you Adventists teach that you'll be without a mediator, and this is scary stuff. Isaiah 53 says this, verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. This is speaking of Christ, a prophecy of Christ. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and look at this, and made intercession for the transgressors. One of the ways that Christ intercedes for us is that he forgives us of our sins. That began at the cross. All right? Romans 8, 26 says this, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our, helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So Christ is interceding for you. Did you know the Holy Spirit is also interceding for you? Not the same way, but he's interceding in that he makes groanings which cannot be uttered. When you pray, you don't even, we don't, we're, we're so messed up, we pray and don't even know what to pray for. It's the Holy Spirit that takes our prayers and brings them to the throne of God and makes them make eternal sense. We'd be praying for stuff that's temporary. Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he liveth, he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And this is the verse where I said, boom, stop. Wait a minute. I thought he stopped interceding when he stood up in Daniel 12.1. I thought he stopped interceding when he said it is done and the smoke came out of the most holy place. But the Bible makes it clear. He never stops interceding. Then what does this mean? Ah, once you understand this, you understand there's great hope in this message. You understand that you, you have a God that does not ever leave you or forsake you. And Paul says, listen, not, what shall separate us from the love of God, what, love of Christ? And he lists all those different things. Nothing will separate us from his love. Watch this. Ella White says it like this, Signs of the Times, 224, 1900, she says, Christ is the minister of the true tabernacle, the high priest of all who believe in him as a personal savior, and his office no other can take. He is the high priest of the church, and he has a work to do which no other can perform. By his grace, he is able to keep every man from transgression. His work as the high priest isn't, ha, huh, this is beautiful, it isn't simply that his work forgives us of sin, church. It is his work as high priest which keeps us from sinning. This is why Noah found grace in the sight of God. I hope you're starting to get it. The reason Noah was able to survive that period of, 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 of probation is because he was connected to God and the grace of God, the power of God held Noah up. Manuscript 73, 1893 says this. And everyone who will break from the slavery and service of Satan and will stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel will be kept by Christ's intercessions. Did you get that? What? It's not that he, he forgives you and he gives up on you. He continues to intercede so that you're not bound by Satan again. Christ, as our mediator at the right hand of the Father, ever keeps us in view. For it is, it is as necessary that he should keep us by his intercessions as that he should redeem us with his blood. I hope you're getting where I'm going. You see, when he gets up and moves out of the most holy place, the time for forgiving sin is over. That type of intercession is over, but he will forever keep us. 
ever intercede for us, ever maintain us in him. Ah, let me show you. Uh, here it is. The rest of that one. If he lets go his hold of us for one moment, Satan stands ready to destroy him. Those purchased by his blood, he now keeps by his intercession. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he liveth, he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He doesn't just save you by washing you clean. He saves you by keeping you clean. And that is the message of the last day. A character like Christ's character. It's not, a lot of other people miss this. And they think they can listen to everything the world does and watch all the world's movies and be corrupted by the world and they're going to be all right. He's calling you to purity. He's not asking you to do it in your own strength. He's interceding. The one type of intercession is that he'll forgive you of your sin. But the other type of intercession is that he'll keep you from sin. <coughs> how deep does this go? Listen to what Ellen White says. Message to young people, page 254. Look how deep this goes. She says, every world throughout immensity, engages the care and support of the Father and the Son. And this care is constantly exercised for fallen humanity. Watch this. Christ is mediating in behalf of man, and the order of unseen worlds is also, uh, also is preserved by his mediatorial work. Did you ever think of that? Even the unfallen worlds are kept unfallen because he mediates on their behalf. Through the ceaseless ages of eternity, he will be working on our behalf. Through the ceaseless ages of eternity, he'll be working to keep us pure. That's powerful. Why? Because it is the love of Christ that constraineth us. He says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. How does that happen? It happens because we're so plugged into him. And that must happen now, church. The world has gone haywire. Up is down and down is up. Wrong is right and, 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 and right is wrong. And if you're not full of the Holy Spirit, studying your Bible, deep in the word of God, if you're not doing that, you're going to be in trouble. He's interceding, but you've got to allow him to intercede on your behalf, to keep you from sin. That's why Genesis 6, 8 is so powerful. Because it was Christ who was keeping Noah. That's why it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Everyone who was lost in the flood could have been saved by the same grace. That movie, uh, 2012, is wrong. Everyone had a chance, just like everyone has a chance now. God is not going to leave this world in this wicked, horrible, violent condition. He cannot. It repents him to look at this world and see people suffering the way they do. Hence he says, behold, I make all things new. Let me tell you, so whatever you're going through, he's going to make it over. And for that reason, I'm happy to be a Christian because I know it is always going to be well with my soul. Probation can close. I'm still going to be all right in Jesus. But while he is no longer interceding to forgive me of sin, he will intercede to keep me from sin. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard the man His glory Of His precious blood atoned
Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with 